Hello, my name is Matthew, and I'm an engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. And my name is Dante, and I'm an engineer here at Hawkridge Systems. And today we're going to be talking about a case study we recently worked on. Um, it's a print to perform case study. The idea is that we're trying to tackle um, common issues or, or just simple issues that can be solved through 3D printing and other additive manufacturing um, uh, tools that are available to us. Um, so in this case study, what we designed was a air box. Yeah, so it's a <laughs> Ram Air, air box for uh, an old motorcycle. And you can't get parts for this motorcycle anymore. And so we decided to make our own. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so um, you know, I, you came up to me with this project because you tried to design one at first using um, some hand measurements, from yeah. my understanding, <laughs> and that we ran into a little bit of an issue at first. So, um, so what we have here is like the first design that you made um, with, yeah. with hand measurements. So the idea is that this is to stick onto, uh, into the frame of a bike. So we have a little bit of a limited space and we have to match up a couple of uh, specific hole locations for the velocity stacks to match up. Yes. Um, so what was the issue that you ran into when you were first designing it? Um, just getting really tight, trying to get really good hand measurements. It was awkward being inside of a frame, so you really couldn't get veneer calibers or tape measure in there to get really accurate measurements. Um, and I thought I had like some really good measurements and I designed this initial box. Um, only to find when I went to fit it, it was too big. <laughs> so I was like, oh, let me try another route. And that's when I talked to Matt Fisher and I was like, hey, can I borrow a scanner so I can scan inside of this motorcycle frame to actually get reference data so I can design an airbox so it fits. Um, and he's like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So, you know, scanners are really easy to use, so I thought it'd be no problem to be able to send it down to Dante. Um, so we sent down the HandyScan um, 700, yep. which is a red light laser. Um, so HandyScan Creoform scanners, um, they are a handheld scanner, um, a laser tracking system, very high level of resolution, very high accuracy. And the targets that we can place inside of the bike um, maintain that accuracy, so you don't have to worry about misalignments or mismeasurements or anything like that. Um, so I sent you the, the scanner, and, and so you just kind of put the targets on the, the bike and kind of just captured all that data. How long did it take to capture the, the scan data? Uh, like five minutes or so. Yeah, even with putting the targets on, just yeah. pretty quick and easy. You know, um, you know this is common an issue we, we see with a lot of people that are trying to retrofit things, where they try to take these hand measurements, they spend a long time measuring them just to find out that a measurement might be off. And so with the of the 3D scanner, five minutes time, you gathered all the data you needed. And uh, once you had that data, you messaged me about trying the next steps. And um, what we really did from there is just take this, this raw 3D scan data and we reverse engineered from it. So what we did is we created some reference bodies inside of SOLIDWORKS. Um, what kind of reference bodies were you really looking for when you're extracting out um, from, that from that scan data? Uh, so we got the interior of the frame, so we knew how wide we can make the air box. We got the actual uh, carburetors as well, so we knew the mounting point and just the geometry of the actual uh, carburetors as well. We also got under the frame where the radiator goes, so we knew, I knew exactly where the mount, how to route the ram air tube, um, so it didn't interfere with any other component inside the motorcycle, like the cylinder, the valve cover, throttle cables, things like that. So we actually reverse engineered a lot of those components so we had reference data to build that air box and the ram air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you saying that one of the big things is you didn't want to move any of the cables. So you wanted to design all those cables so we knew exactly um, what to do with that. And that's actually how we came up with with some of our first designs. So yep. once we had the reference bodies, we were able to import it into another part file. So that way if we made any changes or added any reference bodies, it gets brought in automatically. But um, once we started, uh, once we reverse engineered from that scan data and we started doing our initial designs, um, we kind of chose, uh, so, so based on your first design, we kind of changed it up a little bit in the sense of, especially with the throttle cables, we added this kind of open area right here. Yes. Um, so, so what other kind of stuff did we do to change between your first design and, and this new one now that we had that measured data? I know, for one, we were able to get the, the stacks properly, you know, right <laughs> off the bat. We kind of knew where our range was, but what, what was some other stuff that you kind of were able to use now that you had those reference bodies? Uh, yeah, so I was able to map out exactly how I routed the Ram Air. Um, another thing, after we got the initial design, we wanted to do some flow simulation, and we saw some turbulence towards the front portion of the air box. Um, and one of the first things I think we did was we actually modified the actual top. 
So we started off with this design. Um, like Dante said, we, we kind of just mapped out some kind of frame of the box, um, basic lid, basic interior spots, so we can run the flow sim. Yes. And with the data from that flow sim, we kind of made some little changes. Say so yeah, and the changes that we made, I wanted to do something uh, that was just untraditional, something that you couldn't do when injection molding. Um, and so we added these little, I call them winglets, um, inside the interior of the air box, which it would have been really difficult or maybe even impossible to do with injection molding. Uh, so that's another thing that 3D printing brings to the table that injection molding just couldn't do. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. You know, really, I, re I remember we had a conversation about, all right, now that we have this initial design, we know where the eddies are, we have no plan to th uh, mold this, um, and we wanted to use the HP 5200 to print yes. it, uh, which is that powder-based layer printer. You can add a lot of really cool internal geometry, which is really what, I mean, when you're designing an airbox, you yeah. want ideal <laughs> internal geometry. Um, and we can change up even, yeah, like the lid and everything, just to kind of yeah. reduce as much material, uh, play with the space that we had available, and just really be untethered to a traditional printing setup. Yes. That's why we could add those winglets, why we could add, you know, gaskets and, you know, very specific hole locations and everything like that, yeah. um, which, which was really cool. You know, we were able to take, I mean, how long did it take to go with the hand measurements to a finished product, you know? Do you have an idea of how long it took for that initial? Because I remember it took us about a week's time to yeah. really get our first, you know, once we had the 3D scan, took about a, a day or so to fully reverse engineer everything we needed. Yep. And then it took you about another day and a half to get the initial design. And then setting up the flow sim takes only a couple of minutes. So really, within a week's time, we were able to have our, our initial, initial prints made. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this one, I was going back and forward doing hair, hand measurements like in and out of the garage um, and going back and forth to SolidWorks. So yeah, it probably took me a day just to get this and it didn't fit. So <laughs> if I didn't have the 3D scanner, it would have been multiple iterations of the same part to try to get it to fit. Yeah. Um, so that's and all, that, all that printed material and yeah. wasted downtime <laughs> and everything, which probably is not fun. <clears throat> Um, so we designed this in three parts, yes. and you wanted it so that way it was able to be disassembled and assembled back in. Um, so, so you know, I see that we have some heat certs inserted into yes. here. Um, is that kind of just because we had these three D printable materials? Was it hard to insert these heat sinks? You know, it's pretty common to be able to add threaded parts, um, proper bolting to through three D prints. Um, you know, we use the standard nylon material with the HP fifty two hundred. So, was using the heat certs any difficult, or or what kind of you know? Yeah, you just that. Uh, basically a heat gun with a, a heat cert attachment, and yeah, you just let the actual uh, solder gun heat up, and then they just kind of slot in. In your CAD, you just kind of design design it uh, for the actual heat certs, and it was. I think it, for all these boxes, it may have taken me 20 minutes to do. Every iteration. Yeah. yeah. Is so. this a pretty common thing done with these kind of 3D prints, um, especially yes. for like additive to help with mounting? Do people implement hardware with the 3D printed materials? Yes. Yeah. To assemble things if you're doing a big assembly, because the plastic threads might not last as long depending mm -hmm. on how much torque you have to put on the actual threads. And so, yeah, this is kind of the way that you would go to actually bolt things down and have that longevity as well. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and I do know when we printed this, um, you know, it was uh, also printed in, uh, I believe it was in a single build is what we can get each one. Yes. Um, it was able to fit inside of a single build. So, you know, we did have a little bit of material space that we weren't able to use, but still in the end, we can make these air boxes in a single print, which is pretty cool. And the fact that we could disassemble that we could maybe figure out an optimal way to stack them inside of. Yeah. You know. And we could have added some smaller parts like the velocity stacks themselves. I, <clears throat> we actually printed this on the HP machine, I mean the Mark Forge machine. Um, so we could have actually printed that on the HP machine as well and actually filled up that space if we're going to do like low to medium production for this actual part. We can actually just put the stacks, the air box, I mean the top, <clears throat> the bottom, and the actual RAM air <clears throat> in one build to maximize the part cost. Yeah, you know, really beyond the, the flow simulation, I would say that that was kind of one of the big parts of this project that um, beyond the printable, the, the, the ability to 3D scan, get our reference bodies, that, that flow simulation really helped with our different designs. You know, we made, I believe, four different designs yes. um, in different iterations, and we kind of were able to mix and match them to really find the most optimal one. What was the best lid cover to internal feature to spacing inside of there, you know, not utilizing too much. Um, and, you know, we use the, the ability to clone our simulation. So 
really when it came down to actually running the simulations, that was probably the easiest thing because it was clicking one button yeah. and just <laughs> waiting for it to load, you know, and, and um, you know, really once we had, again, the, those reference bodies and our initial design, it was really just kind of just throwing, the real creativity started to flow. We just were able to yeah. just throw ideas onto the wall, see what stuck in, and be able to test it out from there. Yeah. Um, now I do notice that we have, you know, some of these parts are in the standard, we call it raw material, but we have some that have been uh, colored and, and post-processed. Yes. So um, what does this post-processing do to these prints that, uh, that you find help out? <clears throat> so we actually use the AMT um, vapor smoother to actually smooth these parts. Uh, so what it does, it normalizes all the peaks and valleys in the actual nylon, and it actually helps seal the part. Uh, so from there, if you wanted to, you can autoclave the parts. Um, you don't have to worry about the part absorbing moisture because it's a nylon-based material and it does, does absorb moisture over time, uh, which will cause the actual material to break down over time as well. Uh, so this helps protect, that, protect the part, uh, give it longevity as well, and you get a basically injection molding type finish as well instead of that kind of rough grit looking finish. It'd be really interesting to see too if it gains just a little bit performance having that smooth interior of the air box compared to the rough material. Yeah, because we were in our simulation, you know, we really tried to um, optimize the, the cells within the simulation, really get a high quality result around the velocity stacks, which are really the most important thing to track to see how the air goes in. But, yep. you know, we can't really, you know, we try to account for as many things as possible. But there's just some stuff that you just can't really think of until you have the material itself. So, you know, I'm really curious if that smoothing does actually affect you yeah. know, friction, you know, different kind of, you know, flow sim stuff or the, the flow of the air. Um, I do know another thing that we changed up was, uh, you know, we had our initial velocity stack right here, um, and you found that you wanted to add a couple things after we printed it. So um, I yes. believe on this one over here, you have a couple of mounting spots that have been added. Um, and it looks like you were able to attach them afterwards. So it really doesn't seem like you needed to print a new one if, if needed. So you can always add on to prints and they kind of function pretty well that way. Yeah, so once I got the RAM area in, I was like, oh, where am I going to put my ignition coils now? And so I was like, well, I'm going to have to add something to the actual RAM area to bolt them on. And so I actually printed this using the Mark Forge printer. Um, it's basically just mounts to mount the actual ignition coils. And I didn't want to have to reprint the entire RAM air, so I just printed it. And then I used basically a really strong glue to glue <laughs> them on. And I mean, they're pretty sturdy. You can't pull them off. Um, and I'm actually going to install heat certs into this as well to bolt down the actual ignition coils. Yeah. I just think, I, I, I just know, I, you know, when I saw that, I just thought it was so unique that, you know, you can get a print made and you can get it pretty much as good as you want. Um, we can always add on more, we can always change it up. But, you know, there's times where you just make a print and time wise, you know, it's so easy to just print a small feature and just glue it on. So the fact yeah. that, you know, if you, you print something, you can always add on to it. It's not like the additive doesn't end with just the print. It, you can insert the heat sinks, you can print other attachments and glue them on because this is just standard material that you can work with. Yeah, you yeah know? that's actually a really good point. And another th good point too, if you had to do some minor, minor adjustments, you can, you know, use a Dremel or sand, sandpaper to sand down a little bit of material to make sure it all, everything else fits and you may just have to take a little bit of material off the walls uh, for your final iteration. So that's another option you have as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I just thought that this, like I said, was just a really cool case study. Just the ability to just say, hey, we had this situation, you, you measure it by hand, it, you know, doesn't fit. Again, we run into this issue all the time. And, you know, with the 3D scanners to capture all that data and using SOLIDWORKS for its iterations in FlowSim and the HP printers for its, you know, boundless kind of the ge the geometry for printing. Um, you know, we really just were able to take this case study or this, this situation just really elevate it to a, you know, an end use. Have you been able to use the airbox that much, you know, yet? Or you I haven't. I just kind of did some fitment and yeah, the first try, it actually fit. I had, I wanted to do a couple of different changes once I got in. I was like, oh, I think it would be better if it was, if I made these changes. Uh, but yeah, first try, 
it was all it fit compared to my first iteration that wasn't even close so i was yeah. like completely happy yeah no i, I just and, and you know we even talked about you know just next steps we want to do so we have the heat sense or heat sinks to, to kind of bolt things in but you mentioned snap fit might be kind of even better yeah. you know just for disassembling and whatnot um, I assume we'll just really just have to make some changes in the SOLIDWORKS file. Yeah. You know, because we have the geometry set up already, we know our flow sim works, we know what design we want, and all of our heat sinks, all of our bolting is done externally from the box. So we really, we're confident that we can change this design up inside of SOLIDWORKS and that it's going to snap fit and print and function just well, you yeah. know. Um, well, yeah, thank you, you know, thank you for, you know, like I said, coming up with this, this project to me. It was a, really fun to be able to work on it. Again, it, you know, I've said this enough, but this is really an issue that a lot of customers run into a lot and you know the scanning taking five minutes the reverse engineering giving you all the measurements you need simulation to rapidly test and then the ability to print you know within a day our entire air box you know just a it speeds up timelines and b helps guarantee the best end result product um, so you know with that uh, you know I can't think of any other closing comments to add on this but uh, um, you know, thank you for joining. If you are interested in any of the products we've talked about, whether it's the Handy Scan for 3D scanning, um, SolidWorks, uh, or even Flow Simulation to run these simulations, or the HP Printer, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, and uh, we'll be happy to help you out.